before uh, I began this opportunity to ask some questions and talk about today's hearing because I think it's important to emphasize the statements that were just made that a new day is coming on January 20th. And for any of you who are listening at home, what they're referring to is the inauguration day when the Trump administration comes in and begins their purge of civil servants. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because, yes, we're here to discuss a very serious matter. And absolutely, under no condition should politics be the reason why someone is denied basic dignity, access to emergency resources, and comity by our colleagues, whether that's emergency aid in their homes or access to the bathroom here in the Capitol. Um, and so I think it's important that uh, we talk about what is actually motivating this hearing. Now, I wanna take a moment, I'm a former federal employee, I used to work at OMB, many people know that here on the committee, but I think a lot of people don't fully understand what FEMA does, it's emergency response, and I wanna say thank you to you and all of your team during this summer's historic and catastrophic fires in my district, in Rio Doso and Mescalero Apache, you came to our district, your staff were on the ground immediately, and you deployed every possible resource. And I can tell you unequivocally that it was the best response I have ever seen to a natural disaster in my lifetime. And I can tell my colleagues across the aisle, that area is very much an area that votes Republican, and those of us in New Mexico, we don't care. We don't care what your political affiliation is. We're gonna show up. If you're in need, if you need help, if you're having an emergency, we're gonna show up, we're gonna help. And so obviously all of us are deeply disturbed to learn of this incident. It sounds like the person was disciplined and dismissed, and so we're grateful for that. But I do, I find it odd that we're having a hearing where my colleagues have spent how many hours now, six, eight, I don't even know, at this point, gaslighting us. You know, like, here we are, we're, we're having this hearing about an incident which is totally unacceptable, and yet the gentleman who's about to take office, the president-elect, deliberately and outspokenly withheld aid from his political rivals from the state of California, from Puerto Rico, from communities that he knew did not vote for him. And so I just find it bizarre that we're, that, that we're even having this hearing. And one of the things that I do think is important to emphasize is that this single most impactful thing that happened during those two hurricanes that happened in the October timeframe was the disinformation that dissuaded people in emergency situations from going and getting individual aid in their homes. I don't know how many people felt like they didn't get direct service from FEMA or other emergency responders, but what we do know, because the data tells us, is that there was a disinformation campaign by the candidate who was running for president, members of this committee who were uh, spreading disinformation. And we know that thousands of people in North Carolina and across the South and Florida didn't even go and ask for assistance even though they qualified for emergency assistance for housing, for hotels, for food, and things like that. So if we wanna talk about threats to emergency response, emergency management to our communities. Let's talk about one of the biggest threats, which is disinformation and eating away at the emergency services that help our communities. And I wanna just close on this note because I believe that the purpose of this committee is actually this, the real pretext of what's going on here is that we know, as was just stated by my friend across the aisle, that on January 20th, a new day is coming. And one of the things that we know is that a conservative agenda was put forward by the Heritage Foundation and others in Project 2025, and it called for the privatization, shrinking, and the doing away with certain parts of FEMA and emergency insurance. They are trying to distract from the fact that they know that is what's coming, that is part of the plan. They have not passed an emergency package that they were calling for to help our communities just a month and a half ago, that suddenly, well, we can't pass legislation because we don't need to get it done. So I think it's really important that the American people understand what this is. 
We are going to have to fight to protect our federal employees against what we know is going to be an active purge. And I want to say to all of you and to all of our first responders out there, thank you for the jobs that you do. Thank you for the lives that you save. We appreciate you so, so much. And we're going to fight for you. Chair now recognizes Ms. Green from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, while Democrats are complaining about this lengthy hearing, and uh, about President Trump coming in and slashing and reducing the size of government. I just want to say let the purge begin because there's people that are homeless right now in western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, Georgia. Um, and it's not, it, misinformation is not the most dangerous thing facing us. It's, it's right now pretty much the federal government and the failure to the American people. Uh, Ms. Criswell, uh, in FEMA's, you, First off, let's put this up. This is the strategic plan you have posted on the FEMA website. The goal and objectives laid out in the 2022-2026 strategic plan will help ensure success for our agency, the emergency management community, and those we serve. The plan outlines three bold, ambitious goals to meet this challenge. You have listed as number one, instill equity as a foundation of emergency management. Two, lead whole of community in climate resilience Three, promote and sustain a ready FEMA and prepare, uh, prepared nation. Ms. Criswell, in FEMA's strategic plan document that you crafted, you say, and I quote, we must instill equity as a foundation of emergency management. Oh. Systems that foster inequality serve no one, especially in times of crisis. We must recognize that disasters affect individuals and communities differently, commit ourselves to reducing barriers to access, and deliver equitable outcomes for all whom we serve. The documents adds underserved communities as well as specific identity groups often suffer disproportionate, disproportionately from disasters. However, thanks to whistleblowers that came out, we found out that Trump supporters were uh, also suffering, apparently, worse than others because their, their, their homes were skipped over. And I know you said that you fired the employee that skipped the homes of Trump's, that had Trump signs. Uh, but, you know, we don't believe that was a one-time incident. And now we know there's another whistleblower that has come forward and said that this happened in another state. And you see, the reason why Americans don't believe this is a one-time situation is because they're used to being treated uh, as if they're second-class citizens by the Biden administration. Not only has this happened in FEMA, when they were uh, suffering under horrific conditions after this hurricane, it's happened through the Department of Justice, where the, the Department of Justice has been used against pro-life activists, parents holding their school boards, school boards accountable, and people that protested the election on January 6th. This Biden administration, as a matter of fact, you talk about equity, has treated uh, half of this country and our beliefs and how we feel completely unequitable. So on that note, I also want to bring up that you also said, in administering our mitigation programs, we will keep equity considerations top of mind and will include them in the competitive scoring process for programs such as flood mitigation assistance. What exactly is this scoring process that you use when you are choosing uh, organizations to, to give FEMA funds to? Congresswoman, we have a number of competitive grant programs that provide assistance um, across a variety of areas. The ones that you are speaking of are part of our mitigation program, where we want to build resilience in these communities so they can be stronger against some of the impacts from the severe weather events we're seeing. But we know that many communities don't have paid staff to write grants. They don't have the resources to be competitive against the larger urban areas. And so we want to make sure everybody, again, has access to the programs that we offer and that we reduce those barriers to make sure that they come in on a level playing field and can get access to make their community stronger. Well, in, in uh, the fiscal year of 2023, FEMA spent nearly a billion dollars, 789 million, to shelter illegals in the United States. This past year, it was about 641 million, and this money largely is distributed through NGOs. Uh, 
here's a whole list of them. I know it may be hard to see from there, but this is a whole list of cities, uh, states, and NGOs that received, received millions and millions of dollars from FEMA, and this was to house illegal aliens, not Americans, who, by the way, all that money right there, that comes from Americans' uh, bank accounts when they write their checks to pay their taxes. Do you think it's acceptable for billions of American taxpayer dollars to be spent on housing people invading our country, but yet Americans in North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida are still homeless and have yet to fully receive, receive support? Congresswoman, uh, we have been directed- Is that equitable? We have been directed by Congress to administer the Shelter and Services Program. If Congress chooses to change that direction, we will follow that law. Congress is changing that direction, absolutely. We're gonna put American citizens first, not migrants, because we don't believe that's equitable. You see the situation, putting housing illegal aliens while Americans suffer with Americans' taxpayer dollars, that's not equitable. As a matter of fact, that's the biggest failure that could be ever done to the American people. It's such a failure, it should be treason. And that's how the American people feel. As a matter of fact, regular people are so outraged, they are pissed, furious, at the fact that they feel completely failed by FEMA that's funded by their money, and yet their own money went to house illegal aliens that have invaded this country. Americans are dead today because of the failures at our, of our border, and FEMA took care of these people. You see, that can't, we can't allow that to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair now recognize Ms. Presley from Massachusetts. Administrator, Administrator Chris Weldon, is, uh, thank you for your, your stamina here today. It's good to see you again. Thank you for joining us today and uh, for your leadership. In the face of repeated climate disasters, mass violence, and humanitarian crises, the workers of FEMA represent the very best of public service and deserve the support of Congress. Attempts by Republicans, many of whom are climate and science deniers, uh, in the face of a frequency of events that were once anomalies, but I digress, attempts by Republicans to question the integrity of FEMA workers is a direct attack on FEMA's mission. Its mission is especially vital for our constituents, many of whom face not only the loss of homes and livelihoods, but also lasting emotional and psychological trauma in the wake of such profound loss. Ms. Criswell, um, Administrator, uh, two years ago, my bill, the Post-Disaster Mental Health Response Act, was signed into law by President Biden. It expands mental health supports during emergency declarations. Survivors, in my opinion, deserve not only to heal, but to thrive, and this law moves us closer to that. As someone who is deeply uh, committed to addressing trauma, I'm proud to have partnered with you and FEMA in this fight. Uh, bearing this in mind, can you expound, Administrator Criswell, on how FEMA is incorporating long-term mental health care into its recovery plans to support the survivors of recent hurricanes? Congresswoman, I appreciate your partnership uh, in pushing that bill forward because the impact that these citizens have after a disaster is traumatizing. And what we don't want to do is re-traumatize them with the delivery of our programs. Uh, we have worked uh, with our teams to institute a trauma-informed care approach so we can understand better how a community feels and how a community is reacting to the, um, the impacts from the severe weather event. We also have teams that go out into the field because our staff also get traumatized with the day in and day out conversations with people who have lost everything. And it affects them personally, many of them survivors from previous storms themselves. And so this holistic mental health support is so critical and we have to destigmatize mental health support in a way that encourages our staff but also survivors to get the help that they need. Thank you, Administrator Criswell. Um, when we focus on healing, that's right, we do have to also acknowledge the work of the healer. Who is healing the healer? So FEMA workers themselves are exposed to immense stress and trauma during their services. Um, and as Mr. Uh, Moskowitz was uh, alluding to earlier, uh, there is high fatigue and burnout and, and, and low morale because these are extenuating circumstances with which to be proximate to. Um, what resources or initiatives does FEMA provide to support the mental health of its own personnel after a disaster? 
Uh, we've taken this very seriously, and we have our own mental health advisor at headquarters, but we've also put in mental health advisors in each of our regional offices. And we send teams out into the communities, into our disaster recovery centers and our joint field offices to make sure we're taking care of our people. And even back at headquarters, we will do stand downs to make sure that we're providing the assistance that they need, making sure they know the resources that are available to them. And that when we ask somebody, how are you doing? We're not just doing it in passing and we're really listening so we can understand the stress that they may be going through and encouraging them to take a break if you need a break, but come back so you can help these people. Thank you for recognizing the importance of that work and for your continued partnership. Now, my district, the Massachusetts 7th, relies heavily on FEMA in times of crisis. That's why earlier this year I was proud to work with municipal leaders to secure $2.5 million for the Cambridge Community Center Resilience Hub and the Mill Creek Resilience Program in Chelsea and the Island and River Resilience Project in Everett. Administrator Criswell, while I understand there are many priorities before the new administration steps in, can I have your commitment that FEMA will work to quickly get these funds to my district? And can you follow up with a point of contact I can connect with to follow through on this? Congresswoman, we'll certainly follow up with you on the status of those programs and see where they're at and what we can do to move them along. Thank you. Like every district represented in this hearing room, the Massachusetts 7th depends on FEMA's ability to do its job. We cannot turn the agency into a political game. Instead, we must ensure FEMA and its workers have the resources, respect, and public confidence they need to continue their work. Our constituents deserve nothing less. Thank you. I yield back. Chair now recognizes uh, Ms. McLean. Before I recognize Ms. McLean, we want to publicly congratulate Ms. McLean for being elected uh, the Majority Caucus Conference Chair, that's a big deal, a uh, big high-ranking leader. We have uh, an all-star cast of members in both parties, especially on our side of the aisle, so congratulations, Chairwoman. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we recognize you for five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, there's been a pattern of discrimination, and I think uh, from what I've listened to, you, you want to clean it up today, right? You, you don't approve of what happened. Um, neither side approves of what, what's happened. I mean, we've seen the weapon, weaponization of the, the Justice Department against President Trump, uh, the Department of Education, investigate religious-affiliated universities, the DOJ and FBI targeted parents at school board meetings, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on, right? and I think we all want to clean it up, right? Would you agree with that? Discrimination should never be tolerated. 100%, appreciate that. Now there's a confirmed discrimination against conservatives at FEMA, right? So I just want to put up this timeline to make sure I have everything correct, right? October 22nd, verbal guidance was given by Ms. Washington to um, skip over, for lack of better words, Trump homes, anybody that has a sign, a Trump sign. October 24th, the whistleblower comes forward. October 27th, the team's message that we've seen was sent out. 28th of October, the complaint received by FEMA's legal staff. And October 8th, God bless you, a story became, this story became public. And then on October, or November, excuse me, 9th, you became aware of it and terminated her position, correct? I think we're missing one step in there, Congresswoman. I made a, I was made aware of it on Octo on November seventh. November seventh. Is that I can't see down below. The yeah, October it's not 20th. up here. November seventh. Um, and the I, story became public on the eighth, and then on the ninth, right? I'm sure you had. I was made aware of it on yep. November seventh. I directed my team to get me additional information. They presented that to me on November 9th, which is when I directed the termination of the employee. Thank you. Did did Miss Washington receive a severance package? Um, I would have to check. I don't know. When could you get back to we'll us? So, back. so you have no idea. I, I do not know what the terms of her termination were. Who would? I, I would have to check with my mission support team. Your mission support team. Okay. So, who gave Miss Washington the authority to give the verbal guidance? I do not know what motivated uh, Miss Washington to give that guidance. The direction that she gave was unacceptable and did not align with the way we conduct our business to help the American people. What was her title? Crew lead. Crew lead. And how many crew leads did you have? 
Uh, we had several crew leads I'd have to get back to you with a specific number, but it's one of the lower levels, lowest levels of supervision we have. So, so Ms. Washington had a, a supervisor. Correct. Or, and, and maybe even a supervisor above that supervisor. Correct. Right? There may be layers upon layers. Okay. Why do you think she felt empowered to give that guidance? I can't speak to what motivated her to give that guidance. What I can say is I was made aware of this on November 7th. Okay. It was not acceptable behavior. When I was given the written evidence of her direction on November 9th, we directed her termination. Who is her supervisor? Um, I don't know specifically who her supervisor is. I know that there's um, that this individual, Chad, that has in her supervisory chain, but I don't know if that was her specific supervisor. Have you done an investigation on this we since are, November 9th? We are currently doing an investigation. Currently doing it. it started on October so, 28th. So as of October 28th, we've counsel. done a bunch of investigations, but we have no idea who her supervisor is. No, I said I personally do not know who her, who her specific supervisor is. I have an agency of over 22,000 employees. I don't know the And you have supervisors underneath you. Do you know if anything happened to her supervisor? This is currently under investigation. The only written evidence we had is from Ms. Washington. So we terminated Ms. Washington three weeks after you were made aware of it. Thank God that you were made aware of it or this could, could pattern have continuously gone on because we have layers upon layers, right? You have 22,000 people. I'm sure you have a lot of middle management, right? So you have a crew lead, you might have, you know, I don't know what your hierarchical structure is, but you have layers of management before it gets to you, correct? We follow a very... That's a pretty simple question. Do you have layers of management before it gets to you? A very, you know... That's a great answer. Accepted chain of command practice. Wonderful. So I'll use your word. You have a chain of command before it gets to you, but you have no clue about what's happened to that chain of command and why somebody would let that happen under their watch. Do you think that's worthy of investigating? I absolutely think it's worthy wonderful. Of so when can I expect a report on what has happened to IG those people? To investigate this. When can we expect that report? And what what consequences would you expect for a supervisor who knew this was going on? Would you expect them to be terminated as well? We have an ongoing investigation, and if we find any evidence that shows that there are additional violations of the way we conduct our business, we will certainly take appropriate action. And would appropriate action be terminated? To termination? termination? Wonderful. And when can we expect this report? And we've asked the IG to do this report, and I can connect with them. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Goldman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to make sure I understand what four hours and 20 minutes of fuss is about. Miss Washington was a crew lead charged with uh, helping to provide uh, assistance to individuals in the fo uh, following a, the hurricane, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, you said that FEMA has 22,000 employees? More than. More than 22,000, okay. And as I understand it, as soon as you saw uh, written, verified written evidence that Ms. Washington um, used partisanship to, in uh, executing her job, you immediately terminated her. Correct. And you're now doing an investigation to determine whether anyone else was involved in this. Correct. Seems like. That's the right thing to do. You have a bad apple out of 22,000, and you identified it, and you fired it. I, I don't understand what the massive fuss here is. It's obviously, as you say, unacceptable conduct, and you acted immediately. So uh, this, you know, I, I've not been in here all day, but I've heard the same questions five times myself. I'm sure you've heard them many more times. But it does beg the question about what happens to FEMA if partisanship bleeds into its mission. And I want to bring up two examples um, from the last administration. Hurricane Maria 
you may recall, in September of 2017, hit Puerto Rico, resulting in nearly 3,000 deaths. Donald Trump was president then, and he blocked the full release of the emergency assistance appropriated by Congress in 2018 and permitted only a small percentage of the money to go to the island. He insisted that the Puerto Rico was not in need of that assistance and alleged that the death tolls had been politically inflated, quote, to make me look as bad as possible. In November of 2018, California suffered the most uh, destructive and deadliest wildfire in the state's history. Donald Trump, according to his own former National Security Council staffer, refused to approve disaster aid because the state of California had a Democratic governor and did not vote for him. In fact, the, this former staffer had to go and pull out the voting records from Orange County where the fire was to show Donald Trump that Orange County had more supporters for Trump than the entire state of Iowa so that he would ultimately release the funding. Now, that appears to me to inject partisanship in administering disaster relief. Is that your understanding of what I just recited to you, Ms. Criswell? I was not the FEMA administrator during that time, and uh, I would not care to comment on that. Well, I think it's pretty self-evident that that is exactly what it was. And this now has continued in the recent disasters. We're here focused on one rogue employee who was justifiably and correctly fired. But Donald Trump went on a misinformation campaign to slander your organization. Uh, he one point said that President Biden was sleeping and he was not responding to Georgia Governor Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp responded, the president just called me yesterday afternoon and I missed him and I called him right back and he just say, hey, what do you need? And I told him, you know, we've got what we need. We'll work through the federal process. How about this one? Governor Ron DeSantis, everything we've asked for from President Biden, he has approved. And we do think we'll get more approvals. Republican Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, we got what we need from FEMA. We've had FEMA embedded with us since, you know, a day or two before the storm hit. Governor Glenn Youngkin, Republican of Virginia, I'm incredibly appreciative of the rapid response and the cooperation from the federal team at FEMA. Yet Donald Trump was spreading misinformation that FEMA was not doing its job. And in the last few seconds, I'd like for you to explain how that misinformation hindered FEMA's efforts to provide disaster relief to those in need. Any type of misinformation that creates some type of mistrust in the federal government creates um, a lack of opportunity for individuals that have been impacted by these disasters to get the assistance that they need and that they're eligible for. And we want to be able to reach out to everybody that has been impacted and assure them that we are there to support them, they should register for assistance, and we can work with them to help them on their road to recovery. And do you think that there were some people who did not receive disaster assistance because of this misinformation by Donald Trump? Uh, we will never know if there are people that should have applied and didn't, um, but there is the possibility that individuals may not have applied for assistance because of what they were reading across social media. Okay. Well, there's, there are plenty of uh, publications and media reports about that being the case, and it is a terrific shame. And thank you very much, uh, Administrator Criswell, for all of your hard work during difficult times. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Bowman.